with you in the Midlands. BBC Radio. Call 0845 303 9303. That's 0845 303 9303. He hasn't been busy enough. <laughs> <laughs> you can always book it for next week. <laughs> A bit more Craig. You can. Our very special guest tonight on the Record Collectors is a true stalwart of the 50s and 60s and performing today's. It's a hearty welcome return to Craig Douglas. Welcome to the programme, Craig. Thanks very much indeed. Great to see you. It's been a long, long time, hasn't it? It's been about 20 years or something like that. <laughs> time flies. Time flies. Um, just to refresh, your, you originally, of course, were a, a milkman, so legend has it, on the Isle of Wight. That's right, yeah. What I'll tell you what happened, really. When I was sort of five or six years of age, um, I got bored with the holidays during the summer, you know, six weeks or something. So I actually said to my uncle, who had a farm on the Isle of Wight, um, can I come out on the farm? He said, yeah, sure. So I, I used to go out on the farm and, uh, you know, feed the chickens and this, that, and that, loved every minute of it and just kept going. And then he had a, he had a milk round. And um, so he said, would you like to come on a milk round with me one day? And I said, sure, which I did. And any sort of houses that had very, very long paths up to their front doors, I was the one who was to run up with the milk, you see. <laughs> and um, enjoyed it so much, because it was fresh air, that when I left school, I just carried on on the farm. And, uh, and that's about it, really, because um, whether I was still been on there today or not, I don't know if I hadn't come into the show business, I don't really know. But uh, I did enjoy it very much. Well, the Isle of Wight, there are worse places than the Isle of Wight. It's a beautiful place. Oh, yes, it's lovely. I, I get back there a few times a year. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it because all my family still live there because uh, there was uh, originally nine of us in my family. And um, my mother had three sets of twins. Um, it was extraordinary really because she had a set of boys, then a girl, then a set of boys, my brother and I, then a boy, then boy and girl twins, and then, then a girl. So um, quite extraordinary really. It's a, a long step from sort of fame, really, all parts of then the Commonwealth and Empire as such. So you, had a, you went to London, and I think, was it Bunny Lewis that managed you initially? That's right, yeah. What happened originally, I, I, I actually won a talent competition on the Isle of Wight in a cinema. And the guy that owned the cinema, um, his brother owned the airport at Bembridge, and his father was Colonel Britain, um, and so forth. And he decided, because television was just coming in, this is about 1957, 58, um, and business wasn't too good in the cinema, he decided that uh, he'd have a talent competition. So um, I got home from, from work one day on the farm, and my mother said to me, oh, um, there's a letter here for you, love. And I said, a letter for me? It's the first letter I'd ever received in my life. And it was from the manager of the local cinema, saying, well, would you come down and, and see me and let me know what song you're going to do in the competition on Sunday? And I said to my mother, what's this? Well, look, love, she said, I just put your name down for the, you know, it'd be all right, you know. And I thought, oh, well, I'll have a bit of fun. Because I've always sung, ever since I was very small. My mother had a good voice on her. My sister's got a good voice. And so ever since I was very small, and when I was out on the farm, for instance, singing, you know, and out in the fresh air, it was absolutely lovely. So I went down to do the uh, talent competition, and, and I won the heat. And then we got to the final, which was in November. And um, there was about 30 people in the final, I suppose. You know, there were one or two comedians, a couple of impressionists. And all the others had sort of bootlace ties on and aluminous socks and Tony Curtis air cuts, all singing Elvis Presley songs like. And as it was November, um, I thought, what am what, what, what I going to sing? And I thought, it was not far off Christmas. So I sang Mary's Boy Child which uh, was doing very well at the time. And um, so I won the talent competition, won a fiver. And then the manager of cinema said to me, look, you know, I think, you know, we ought to learn a few more songs and things. So we found a keyboard player in the Isle of Wight. I learned a few songs and then uh, went to London to have some uh, singing lessons. And then he said, I'm going to put another show on the Isle of Wight and I need somebody to top the bill. And at the time, the mudlarks were very big. Mm. So uh, he phoned their agent up, who happened to be Bunny Lewis, and he invited him and his wife down for the weekend, and they came to see the show, and uh, we did two shows. And um, apparently my agent said to, his, uh, said to his wife, you know, what do you think of him? And he said, well, he's like a sort of pericoma, isn't he? I mean, he doesn't seem to care. And um, so, in fact, after I finished the first show, 
my agent's wife came round to see me, and even to this day, I don't remember it. Uh, she always tells me so that because uh, I didn't put any makeup on, you see, she actually put a bit of makeup on, a bit of her makeup on for me. And because uh, I said, "Oh, I don't want to put makeup on," I said, "Oh, my, some of my mates are out there, and they're going to say hello, hello, hello. You know, wear makeup and things. You know what I mean?" So it all sort of started from there, really. And then I went to London. I had some singing lessons, and um, and then you know, uh, along made a couple of records. Well, which was your first record label? First record I ever. Uh, the first uh, record label was Decca. Yes. Uh, with Dick Rowe, who was... Uh, Legend. <laughs> that's right. Oh, who turned the Beatles down. And um, I did a song called Sitting in a Treehouse. It's a bloody awful song. It really was. <laughs> Written by, fell enough, Burt Bacharach and Al David. And then after that, I did a song called Are You Really, Really Mine? So all it was really doing was getting the name over. Then all of a sudden, Bunny Lewis, my agent at the time, said, well, I think I've got a television show for you. And I said, really? Blimey. And it was Six Five Special. And I'll tell you what happened on the first Six Five special I did. We did it on the Saturday, obviously, at five minutes past six. And um, we had a call from Russell Turner, who was the uh, producer yes. and director on Six Five special. He called Barney, my agent, and said, oh, can I see Craig, you know? And uh, so anyway, he called me, and I thought, what's this all about? He said, well, I don't know. So I went to see him in his office. And there was about 12 enormous mailbags there. And he said, these are for you. And I said, for me? And I looked through all the mailbags, and they were all saying exactly the same. I just took two or three from each bag. They were all saying the same thing, and that was the fact that, isn't it lovely to see somebody on television singing a song and you can hear all the words? Because in those days, you see, mm -hmm. Marty was on and Cliff, Joe Brown and all that, all singing rock and roll things. And um, so it did me the world of good, really. Yeah, I well remember those days very well. Any memories of those other British rock stars, uh, any st stories that are repeatable, have you say, from those days? Well, know? I mean, the, the thing is, we always have... I remember one day, actually, at Six Five Special, and um, uh, Bunny, my agent, was up in, up in the box, and uh, somebody came up and had a chat with me and said, oh, look, here's my car, and, you know, and he said, ever you're in trouble in town, or anything, give me a ring, you know, if you want to put up for the night, anything like this. I said, oh, thanks very much. I was quite naive then. Oh, thanks very much indeed. And all of a sudden, Bunny came rushing down like that, you know, and sort of interrupted us. And um, and this guy wandered, around, wandered off, and it was Larry Pond, you know, right. who at the time, you know, he had Dickie Pride and Billy Fury and all that sort of thing. And uh, he said, oh, you know, be careful of him, you know, and all that sort of thing. As I say, you know, being a 16-year-old coming up from the Isle of Wight, you know. I mean, I was amazed when I first came up to the Isle of Wight. I remember going to the Hilton Hotel one night. <clears throat> hadn't been built long and I just couldn't believe it because I'd never seen a hotel that big in the Isle of Wight you know <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> absolutely extraordinary and then of course you went to top rank records didn't you that's right well Dick you see left Decca and uh, although Dick and Bunny my agent used to produce my records he, he left Decca and went to top rank and the thing was I think in many respects it was a it was a tax thing for top rank because they built some studios which they never never used because we made all our records at uh, Abbey Road and um, uh, and then after, there was a, a clause in my contract saying that if ever they went bust, I was to go to EMI. And of course, after about three, rec three or four records, you know, they lasted two years or something like this, then uh, it was over to EMI. Of course, you had quite a bit of success under Top Rank, didn't you? Pretty Blue Eyes. And oh, yeah. And we had, uh, well, the first one we did was a song called Come Softly to Me, which the Fleetwoods did oh, originally yes. in America. And then, um, then the one after that was Teenage in Love, which uh, got to number nine. Marty did that as well. I think you outsold Marty on that, didn't you? Uh, well, I may have outsold him, but because of the way it works, you know, uh, there was a time when I didn't sell any records because they couldn't produce them fast enough. And uh, so they went up and people, if people liked the song, they didn't, they said, well, we've got one by Marty. Well, okay, I'll buy that one, you know, so they bought that one. In fact, Marty got to about number five with it, and I got to number nine. Because I don't know if you know this, but I'm the only guy, only singer, that had four records in the charts that all went to number nine. Why they didn't go to number eight or ten or whatever, they all actually went to number nine. It's extraordinary. There was one record, and I, I, 
uh, because I've left my glasses behind. I'm trying to read it. But I'm pretty sure, because I've got it, um, and I have two versions of 100 pounds of clay. Oh, that's right. Uh, and one was uh, the original version of it, where you just say it as it is, and then eventually the BBC uh, oh, yes. uh, wanted the other version, in which you had, had amendments to it. Could you, can you right. tell me about that? Yeah, well, Bunny, my agent, uh, went down to, at an appointment with Mark White, who was head of the BBC then. And uh, he said to him, oh, by the way, I've got Crane's latest record. Oh, have you, have you, dear boy? He said, well, shove it on. So he put it on, and after, he said, dear, oh, dear, he said, you can't play that on the BBC. And Bunny said, why not? He said, you can't say he, cr he created a woman and lots of loving for a man. I thought, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> so obviously we thought, well, the BBC are not going to play the record. So Bunny came back to me. We, we had a chat for a while. And what we did, we went back to, uh, back to EMI, got a hold of the master, put it on again, and um, Bunny and I rewrote the four lines that they objected to. So instead of saying he created a woman of lots of love and for a man, we said he created old Adam and then made a woman for the man, you know, which yeah. is uh, crazy, isn't it? And the strange thing is that the um, record company already uh, sort of pressed, I think about 5,000 records or maybe 10,000. So then we had to have this other one done, which we did. And um, so what we did, we did an acetate, you see, of this, this, uh, the, the, the new lyrics, took it back to Mark White and said, listen, we can't have the BBC not playing crazy record. He said, no, no, you're absolutely right, old chap, you know. So I said, we've amended it. Have you really? Oh, listen to it. Oh, that's wonderful. So in fact, the BBC played it. When people went out and bought it, they bought the original version, you see. <laughs> so, uh, so in fact, there's two versions of it. There's JAR 555 and 556. And both, in fact, of course, the other version is extremely collectible. Yes, it is. There is a, another record that uh, we seek often. is called It's Trad Dad. Mm. Uh, which is, uh, you have a, a friendship which goes back now 30 or more years with Helen Shapiro, who you're touring with currently. Uh, but can, do you remember filming that uh, It's Tried There? Yes, I do, actually. I mean, it's the first film I'd ever done in my life. And uh, I should say, at the time, I think I was about 19. And um, the worst thing for me was having to get down to the studios about 6.30 in the morning, because if you're working and doing shows, you're not getting in until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. But uh, it was quite, it fascinated me actually because Dick Lester directed the film, who did the Beatles films as well. And um, what amazed me was that coming from the Isle of Wight and going to a film studio, I went into one of the other studios one day while I had two or three hours off and they were filming a war film or something. And there was half a plane against a wall. Then they had this sky and they pressed a button, the sky moved, but nothing else. And everything went, I thought, oh dear, oh dear, this is how they do. Then there's another thing where there was a, a guy and his girlfriend sat in the back of a taxi, and they had the driver there, and they had a fella each side of the taxi with a plank of wood, just lifting it up and down as if it's <laughs> traveling. And, uh, and everything went out of my mansion. I thought, if that's how they make films, I don't want to know anymore. Which studio really? was that? Was that Shepparton? That was oh, Shepparton, yeah, yeah, that was Shepparton, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you meet, I mean, Gene Vincent appeared in that, of course. Uh, well, actually, what happened was that uh, they did all the Americans, they did them in America. Right. All the English, they did them over here, and they just sliced it together. Did you ever meet any original, you must have met some of the American oh, rock yes. stars. Oh, yes, I mean, uh, I remember, well, the first time that, the first time that the Beatles uh, backed me in Liverpool was um, they, they were doing a tour with Little Richard. And Bunny, my agent, had a call from somebody and said, would I go up and do some shows at Liverpool Empire? So I said, fine. This is 63, I think it was. And anyway, I got up there with my keyboard player, got in the dressing room, and a fellow came in and said, oh, my name's Brian Epstein. And I said, oh, how do you do? You he said, are you ready for rehearsal? I said, yeah. I said, well, by the way, do the boys read music? He said, no, I'm afraid they don't. I thought, oh, dear, oh, dear. And I said to my keyboard player, I said, here we go. We're going to do the whole act in one key, you know. And then went down to the stage, and there was John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and things. And um, although they couldn't read music, um, they, they did a, a fine job. And when we finished rehearsal, even, I heard them in their dressing room sort of say, no, 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 it's a C flat. They're, you know, no, just like that. And they were still rehearsing. And I thought it was absolutely lovely. And, uh, and I remember that one of the nights we were there, because Little Richard, as I say, was on the show, and uh, Kenny Lynch. I was deputizing, actually, for, for Sam Cooke, who was doing a Jewish charity show somewhere. And, uh, and one night, I was staying in, in, in Chester, and when you come out of the theatre at Liverpool Empire, the, the tunnel to go through the Chester is right across the road. Well, one night I, I went out there and 
got into the tunnel there and I gave the fella a fiver or something and he said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, you know, I've only just come on duty. I can't change it. And I said, oh, hang about. So I backed my car back to the theatre, went in there and the first guy I bumped into was John Lennon. And he said, oh, I thought you'd gone home, Craig. I said, no, I'm trying to get through the tunnel. I explained it to him. So I said, oh, by the way, could you change a fiver? And he said, change one. He said, I've never seen one. (laughs) And to that day, he actually lent me half a crown to go through the the tunnel. So it was lovely. Uh, the American stars, I mean, did you, uh, any memories of the American stars you've Oh, yeah, of? I mean, um, Eddie Cochran, uh, I worked with on two or three occasions, a lovely, lovely man, terrific guitarist, absolutely wonderful. I mean, many people say that uh, yeah, even the visuals of him, the film of him, doesn't, don't show, A, how good he was and how handsome he was. No, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right. He really was, I mean, he wasn't the greatest singer in the world, but as, as far as guitarist, was, he was absolutely, absolutely amazing. And uh, say, Little Richard was, well, Little Richard's Little Richard, isn't he? You know, uh, and so forth. And um, Crosby, I mean, although he wasn't uh, a rock and roller, I met him, fell out for me, were doing his trad down because they were doing Road to Hong Kong or something down there. And I met him also again a few years later in, uh, in Nairobi at Mount Kenya Safari Club, which I went, I'd gone to for the weekend. And um, yeah, so, and Bruce Chanel, and uh, oh, there's quite a few of them. We did Sunday concerts more yes. than anything, they were just thrown together. Um, of all the songs you've recorded, are, what are your sort of favourite two or three that sort of you just like the reaction it gives uh, when you perform? Well, I mean, Teenager Love is one because everybody knows it and they sing along with it, you know. Um, strange enough, a lot of the records that, uh, or a lot of the best songs that I've ever recorded. Uh, which I loved, weren't hits. You know, you hear a song and, and you record it, you say, you know, that, is, that was perfect. And then um, you suddenly find, and for some reason or other, it wasn't a hit, you know, whether it's because it's the time of the year or, or whatever, I really don't know. Well, I've brought along some of my old records here, which I uh, uh, have you on. Here's uh, Let You Choose Anything Off See, that's a good song. That was a Christmas song, actually, called No Greater Love, actually. and. Um, it was written by, uh, by my agent uh, because he wrote quite a few songs, actually. He wrote Caramia for David Whitfield. Oh, yeah, and, uh, um, um, number one in America. That's it? right. He wrote The Girl of My Best Friend for Presley, and he's, he's written quite a few songs. He wrote a lot for Cliff as well because he and Nori Paramore, when we went to EMI, wrote a lot of songs together. And, um, yeah, you see, there's... Uh, yeah, you see, No Greater Love was it's a good, good Christmas song, actually. Um... What other ones have we got here? Um, our favourite melodies I've always liked because if you listen to the words of our favourite melodies, they're all made up of song titles of the 60s. You know, Hit the Road Jack, Take Good Care of My Baby. And uh, that always goes down goes down pretty well. And only 16, of course, uh, it's wow. always... Uh, well, we'll play some of those tracks right now, but there's an album I picked up at a record fair um, and you've signed it to Eileen, who obviously sold it eventually. But do you remember making that album? It's... Um, the old Lonesome Me album. That's right, yeah. Uh, strange enough, I'm just having some work done in, in, in my house in London. And um, I found uh, about a dozen of these, actually. And uh, see, some of the, a lot of these songs are songs that I actually recorded. But we, see, when we went into studio to, to make a, a new single, we did an A and a B side. Yes. And if we had time, we threw another one as well, you know, because the musicians say, no, hang on, look, we've only got another 10 minutes before we, fi- you know, usual, before we finish. But we always threw another song in. And, uh, and these are a lot of songs, actually, uh, like from Russia With Love, you see, which Matt, Matt Monroe, yes. bless his heart, uh, had a hit with. Well, he did it in the film as well. Uh, I'm On The Outside Looking In, that is a very, very good song. Well, this album, actually, Craig, is, is worth, uh, though I bought it quite recently, I think I gave five pounds for it. Yeah, yeah that's about ten years ago. Mm. But it is actually worth about 12 to 15 pounds, so those albums at home are worth something. Yeah. I must say, when I come up north here a lot, because up here, as opposed to down south, you don't have what we call markets, you know, like indoor markets. You might have one or two in the East End or something like this, but when I'm up here, actually, I always sort of wander around. I mean, people don't recognise me so much now, you know, but if there's a record store there, you know, I'll go, all right, yes, fine, lovely. And I'll look through, and there may be a couple of 45s of mine there, you know, and I'll say, yeah, <laughs> how much want for these? Well, I said, well, it's Craig Douglas. So, oh, I'll give us 10p each for them, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're worth a lot more than that to us, Craig. Can I say on behalf of all our listeners, thank you for some great songs. I'm going to play some of your music now, and thank you very much for being a guest of Mike Adams and Chris Savory, the Record Collectors. 
Thanks very much indeed. It's been great to see you and uh, lots of uh, health and good happiness to all your listeners for year 2002. Craig Douglas, thanks very much indeed, Craig, for doing the interview with us. Yeah. Yes. So we've had, I don't know, 150 phone calls tonight, and it's never stopped ringing since. People want to know what was Cliff Rich's middle Christian name? Roger. Roger. And how was it spelt? R O D R G E R. Ah, right. So that's where one or two people went wrong. Okay. That's it. Or anyway, wherever you are, by the way, if you want an Elvis record playing next week, don't forget to drop a postcard to uh, the record collectors. P.O. Box 96, Shrewsbury, S113 WW. Peter will be actually taking Tony's uh, corner next week because uh, we'll be looking at Elvis Presley, amongst other people, and Trevor will be doing all the bits and pieces and sorting out uh, what's on the TV and what's on the radio. And you, of course, will be somewhere else. I will be on distant climbs, enjoying the sunshine, <coughs> which we haven't got here. You sure you don't want those Turkish pounds? <laughs> no, I definitely don't want those Turkish pounds, thank you. And Al Stewart, uh, the year of the cat, he'll be joining us too next week on your local BBC radio station. For every kiss you're given, and I thank you every night. You can't have that Cliff Richard down moment. No matter, now, we stop squabbling. Just pass me that 10 inch record on the. No, give, just pass it me. Just, uh, he won't miss his Billy Ward 10 inch album, will he now? Won't he? Oh, he's back! <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to The Record Collectors with myself, Mike Adams, and Trevor Johnson, and Tony Thank Fry. You. And Tony Fry. We'll be on the same spot on the dial next week. I hope you enjoyed the Elvis week and uh, catch us somewhere on one of your radio stations. And uh, don't forget, if you've missed us tonight, good luck to you. <laughs> uh, but you can book your call, of course, on 0845 303 9303 or your record once next week. Wherever you are, have a great weekend and thanks for your company.